Hey, everybody. Welcome live to the Gym Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. Hope everybody's doing well. It's so great to have you with us from all around the world, our international lovity, Jameis lovity audience who watches and supports our show from all across the United States, Canada, all throughout North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, New Zealand. We love you all. Thanks for all the tweets, the Facebook messages, the emails, and everything else. We really appreciate it. You can find all of that at Gym Masters TV. Of course, uh, the YouTube channel where we house the Gym Master Show Live series is Gym Masters TV as well. And we're just shy of a thousand episodes in under three and a half years, which is absolutely incredible. With extraordinary guests coming in from all walks of life, Broadway, Hollywood, television, film, music, stage, culinary arts, sports, comedy, you name it. And we have an interactive opportunity right now. If you'd like to comment and say hello, our uh, JMS Lovety Hall chat room. You guys know I'm a very active uh, and proactive and interactive host. And if you'd like to comment and say hello during our broadcast, which is live right now, you can chat in the Jameis Liberty Hall chat room when you subscribe to our YouTube channel. So exciting. I love when guests come on our show and experience what we do here, which is quite unique on the Gym Masters Show Live series. And uh, they want to come back. They want to talk about new projects. They want to talk about, you know, things that they've been doing, update us on their lives. And somebody who is... Uh, a beloved friend of our show, an iconic, revered, multi-Emmy nominated television, film, and stage actress is back with us here on the show. And we've been chatting. We've been having such, oh, if you only heard the chat we had before we went live on the air, we were really connecting and reconnecting. And I love that. She wanted to come back on the show. We wanted her to come back on the show. And it's always a warm and welcoming place for our very special guest, the iconic Lee Purcell is joining us. Now, of course, you know her from some of your favorite television shows and films and stage productions, extraordinary productions that uh, have garnered a lot of acclaim and a lot of awards and so much more. She is a very spirited person. She is a very empathetic person. She's an extraordinary actress. And there's something quite exciting as well that she's involved in the Hollywood Radio Players. We're going to talk about that. It's something very, very special and quite new. And originally, it was hosted by somebody who's also a legend in television, uh, the host of Dancing with the Stars for many years, and a lot of, of course, Hollywood Squares, the iconic uh, Tom Bergeron. And what's really exciting about it is Tom has uh, been you know, working on a new film, in pre-production. So uh, they brought in another host who is another legend that is a beloved fan favorite, Lisa Gibbons. And of course, you know, Lisa Gibbons from Entertainment Tonight and, and so much more. She is extraordinary as well. Lisa is now uh, the host of the Hollywood Radio Players, which is something really, really cool. And uh, it raises money for a very special organization, which we're going to talk about. We're going to actually tell you ways that you can even uh, donate towards this, which I think is really cool. And some of the shows that they're, take a look on your screen. We just pulled up just two of them. Um, some of the incredible shows that they're doing in an old school format, I think is really, really special. You see two of them on the screen there right now. Multi Emmy nominee Lee Purcell has really donned her director and producer's hat as well as starring in virtual productions, benefiting something very, very special and near and dear to everybody's heart. That's the Motion Picture and Television Fund. And I think that's really, really special and something really, really important. And the fact that, uh, you know, this is something that she's wanted to do, something that she believes in and she cares about. So know that when you do donate, that you are helping in that cause, uh, which I think is really, really fantastic because the Motion Picture and Television Fund is a 501c3 charity. And Lee announced that friend and colleague Lisa Gibbons stepping in as the next celebrity host for the Hollywood Radio Players following Tom Bergeron, who again is in pre-production with the movie. The Hollywood Radio Players invite you to enjoy the virtual anthology series Lots of great ones, too. It began with The War of the Worlds, 
based on the original 1938 broadcast by Orson Welles. Yeah. And again, to benefit the Motion Picture and Television Fund, starring the Hollywood Radio Players with previous host Emmy winner Tom Bergeron, directed by Emmy nominee Lee Purcell and editor Michael Carnegie, with all the proceeds, again, benefiting the fund, as we mentioned. It's really something very, very special. Let me tell you just some of the productions, the projects that we're talking about that uh, Lee is working on, which I think is something really, really special. In addition to these two here, let me give you this iconic list, some really special ones that you're going to want to check out. The War of the Worlds we mentioned, The Hitchhiker, The Life of Riley, Our Miss Brooks, Father Knows Best, Beauty and the Beast, Gunsmoke, Dragnet, The Bad Man, The Bicker Sins. Future productions include Casablanca, Our Town, and The Maltese Falcon. <laughs> I mean, these are real top shelf productions that we're talking about here. Legendary and iconic of course, uh, here's Lee with Steve McQueen, another beloved television, film, stage actor, and uh, who we lost way too soon. He really was a mentor to uh, Lee in the early years, and they remained friends for many, many years. An iconic actor, an incredibly talented individual who we miss even to this day. Uh, so it's really a, a terrific opportunity to learn about the Hollywood radio players, but also to welcome back to the Jim Master Show Live exclusively the incomparable, effervescent, twinkling Lee Purcell. Lee, welcome to the show, my friend. It's so good to see you and welcome back home. Well, I'm I'm really happy to be here. I'm so happy I'm effervescent and <laughs> twinkling. twinkling and <laughs> <laughs> Call me Shirley. Um, <laughs> How have you been since we chatted last? I have I have been good. I mean, obviously there was a few interruptions, like a worldwide pandemic, and um, and then now we are in um, our industry. We are living through two major strikes, both the Writers Guild and um, and my union, SAG-AFTRA, and um, so we uh, we are. Uh, we are we are challenged, uh, and we have been challenged for the last four years. And but you know, life is still good, and I'm just totally thrilled to be back on here with you and the Levities because I remember the Levities very well. Oh, and we're welcoming uh, you with open arms here too. I love yeah. that. Oh, look yeah. at that! I love that. Isn't that great? Oh, it's so nice. Thanks, guys. Yeah. So I'm thrilled to be back and to talk to you about. We can talk about whatever we want to talk about. I said we cannot talk about, as as you and I know, past which, and which the audience might not realize that. Okay. Yeah, there's a certain um, there's a protocol that we and the right. union have to follow right now, because we're in a very delicate um, time yeah. with um, the negotiations, and so we cannot uh, promote or. Um, show photos or uh, talk about um, past projects, um, current projects, future projects that have anything to do with the people that we are negotiating with. And that makes actually very good sense. But um, we can, I can talk about, you want to talk about, I don't know, cooking, which I really hate. But if you want to talk, <laughs> you want to talk about- Green that, Tharm, do you like to garden? I do. I'm a really good yeah, gardener. Me too. Yeah. I, I love gardening and yeah. um, and horses and I, whatever. I can talk about anybody wants to talk about anything like that. I can talk about. But I love obviously talking about Hollywood radio players because that is my baby right now. It's my mm. pet project. And um, and so how did I that think, start? Uh, how did you come up with the idea? What was the thought process? And is this something, Lee, that? Uh, you and the team have been thinking about doing for a long time. What was the inspiration no, for it? No, no. What happened? What really this, this is a baby that was birthed out of the pandemic uh, because we, um, Michael and I, Michael Carnegie, my producing partner, who is a genius. Um, we were in a, a different group and we were performing live for uh, quite a long time doing uh, performing classic radio plays with obviously new actors, contemporary actors. And then because of the pandemic, it was shut down. 
because all live uh, performances worldwide were shut down, all theater companies. And so we were like, oh, now what do we do? Yeah. And I had seen, uh, it, this kind of took a, a long while to evolve. It wasn't like an instant thing, but uh, I, I'd seen a friend of mine and he was, he was performing on Zoom uh, and we were all very accustomed to being on Zoom um, uh, during, we became accustomed during the pandemic as everybody in the world did. But Zoom was created for corporate and it was created for business meetings, that kind of thing. Right. But I saw my friend on a um, show on Zoom and it was, it was a, a very simple show. And, but it was, I thought, really effective and really funny. It was a group of actors, uh, some of whom were soap opera stars, some of whom were from film, television, whatever. But they were, they were, uh, they created a show that was a parody of a soap opera, and they did that uh, for several episodes. And I saw that, and I thought, huh, I wonder if we could do an upgraded version of that and do classic radio plays reenact on Zoom. And so we uh, started doing it. It was really hard because like I said, Zoom is not made for this. And and what we do, if you see our shows, which you can see on hollywoodradioplayers.com or our YouTube channel, Hollywood Radio Players, what we do is very elaborate. And as we have gone through our learning curve, it's become more elaborate and more complex in a good way because we have special effects, we have sound effects, we, we are fully costumed, we, there, yeah, that's our, that's our website. And yeah, that just shows me. And, and then I think then there's Michael. And um, so we decided to, to do this and we started doing it. These are, these are some of our players and mm, Interesting, and um, <clears throat> and and we and we started doing it, and then at one point, it was like, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could raise money by doing this for an industry charity? Because we have three major industry charities in the entertainment industry, and they were all just stretched to the breaking point. But because I'm a union activist and a leader in the union. I had already been working with the Motion Picture and Television Fund uh, in a different aspect. So I went went to them and said, would you like us to raise money for you through our shows? And they went, oh God, yes, please. And because they were having, real, and still having a very hard time. So we, uh, we do that, that's what we do. And when you watch our shows on, on YouTube, you will see uh, when the host, and it's either going to be Tom or Lisa, depending on the show you watch, um, will we'll tell you how to donate. Now, you can watch our shows totally for free, and we encourage you to do so. We don't get upset. Uh, but if you can spare anything, and it is tax deductible because the Motion Picture and Television Fund is a 501c3. It is a nonprofit, and it is a very legitimate. It's been around for over 100 years. Oh, yeah. I think, I think 101 now. And um, so if you can spare anything, that would be great because, you know, it's uh, half of 1% of the actors in my union um, are, are wealthy. The others are not. And, and then the Motion Picture and Television Fund helps across the spectrum of people in the entertainment industry, whether they are a cameraman, whether they are um, a carpenter, where they're, whatever they do, if they do craft service, which is when you put out the food for yeah. people um, to have, or they're a caterer, or they're the medic, or it, whatever it is, these are not wealthy people. And and they live paycheck to paycheck, most of them. And now- it surprises people sometimes. They think everybody, you know, just because they hear New York, they hear Hollywood, they hear television, film stage, that everybody is uh, extremely wealthy and not necessarily the case. No, I mean, it's, no, it's definitely not. For instance, in my union, um, in order to qualify for our health insurance, you have to make $26,000 in change. 
87% of the people, the members in the union, and we have over 160,000 members, 87% cannot qualify for health insurance, which means they make under $26,000. Mm. So, so this is not a wealthy demographic. And, and the other unions are the same. I mean, it's, it's really, um, it's not what people think. I know that I've seen because of the strikes that are going on and we're, you know, we're picketing and we're just trying to get a fair living wage for people. And um, I'm not talking about people in the half, half of 1%, I'm talking about everybody else, middle class and below actor. Um, but I, I, I've seen people, you know, who, who simply don't understand because they're not in the industry say, well, so-and-so, and I won't name the person, but so-and-so makes $32 million a year. Why should they complain and pick it? It's like, well, because he's half of 1%. He's not in the 87% who can't qualify for $26,000 to earn that for health insurance. So, and, and the people we're negotiating with, and nobody's saying they're all bad people. But, but they are um, not uh, favorable towards actors earning a living wage because then that cuts down on their uh, report to their stockholders. So, um, so hence, uh, Motion Picture and Television Fund uh, steps in to help people because sometimes people can't afford uh, food, you know, and they will come with giant boxes of food and help them. There it is. Great, great organization. And you know, what's really interesting is that they operate with a relatively small staff. Mm. These people are really <laughs> overworked um, and overwhelmed, but they do a great job. And, and so during these difficult times, pandemic and now the two strikes, um, you know, they're helping people with rent and car payments and gas money and you know, pretty basic living things and healthcare, and um, and so if you can spare anything, great. If not, please do watch our shows anyway and enjoy them, because we really make them for you. You know, we don't make them for us. Uh, uh, we make them for you, and we have a really good time doing it. And um, and it's a lot of work. And there, oh, yeah. is, there's the bad man. That the bad man is a very uh, funny and kind of dark, but funny um, Western. It's one of our shorter shows. I forget. I think it's 15 minutes or something. Some of our shows are long. Dragnet, of course, is iconic if you're of a certain age. And um, Dragnet started um, in radio. It did not start on television. That's right. It started in, in radio in the 1940s. I mean, I do all the research, so I try to remember everything. But once I write the intro, it's gone, you know. But and then uh, that's Gunsmoke, of course. Gunsmoke. I find uh, Gunsmoke. If you're familiar with it, if if you are of a certain age and you know what that is, um, Gunsmoke started on radio, did not start on television, and it started not with James Arness, who played Matt Dillon on television. Started with William Conrad, uh, Bill Conrad and who played Matt Dillon. He has an incredible voice, incredible radio voice. And But when it came time to for them to start a TV show in the early 60s, uh, they looked at Bill Conrad and he's short, he's very round, and they thought, mm, he doesn't match his voice. So John Wayne suggested this new kid named James Arness. And so he got the role, but they kept the radio show going simultaneously with Bill Conrad, and then the TV show um, with James Arness for about five or six years until the radio show finally went off the air. And then Bill Conrad became a TV star from some other shows that um, I did two of those with him. And Beauty and the Beast is another fabulous one, huh? Beauty and the Beast is really, really interesting. I play Beauty. That was a very complex and fun show to do, uh, but Beauty and the Beast um, really, like I said before, once I write the intros, oops, research is gone. <laughs> but um, it Beauty and the Beast did not come from what you might think it came from, which was a contemporary project that I can't name, um, but um, it actually came from a, a fairy tale and a myth from, I 
you'll, you'll know if I'm wrong when you watch the show and you see the intro. I think Tom does that one. But I think it's in the 1200s, 1200s or 1400s. And it was, and that was a, a fairy tale. And, and it, it has had so many iterations, so many different versions of, of that, and, you know, books, fairy tales, um, operas, uh, movies, and so many. And so that one was pretty fascinating because we're actually, actually reenacting something that was, is very, very ancient. It's a very ancient tale. It's really interesting to do. It's incredible. I mean, so many, it's, the selections are extraordinarily, uh, Father yeah. Knows Best, another one. Mm. I directed that one, yeah. Mm. And that one was from, uh, again, it was a radio show first, and then it became uh, a, TV, a TV show. And um, Robert Young, who I worked with later, but Robert Young, um, he, he actually took the radio show to TV as a producer and recast everybody but himself. So <laughs> pretty, <laughs> pretty interesting, um, but, it, but it did work out you know, very, very well. And, and there, there's a lot of interesting little tidbits about Father Knows Best, but again, when you watch it, you'll hear the intro and, um, and, and a lot of, of my research and Michael's research is, is, in, is in that intro. Our Miss Brooks, of course, remember the iconic Eve Arden. Eve Arden, very iconic, you know, and again, it started in radio. That's right. Moved to, moved to TV. And then there were even two, two other iterations of it. I had to check myself constantly, make sure I don't say something that I'm not supposed to per union rules. Right. But, you know, Eve Arden had, and that's me. You can, you can only say every third word. <laughs> Pretty, yeah. Oh, like. A, uh, sounds dog. like. Place your raids, <laughs> right? Sounds like. I feel like. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to talk like this, but um, so our Ms. Brooks, obviously I play Ms. Brooks. That's my, uh, that's myself on the poster. And Michael, who is just truly uh, a man of all trades and an expert at all of them, um, Michael Carnegie, he, um, he creates our posters. He does our editing. Um, he plays an awful lot of the roles and he is a very versatile, uh, gifted actor. He can do Really, almost anything. He played Orson Welles in War of the Worlds that I, I directed. He plays uh, the the curmudgeonly, if I'm saying that right. Um, curmudgeonly, yeah, yes, curmudgeon. <laughs> that's a hard one. Curmudgeon. That's a that's a tough one. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, principal in um, Aramis Brooks, and and he's just I I can't say enough good things about him, or I can't say enough praise of him. Because without him, I couldn't, I could not produce these shows, mm -hmm. and and I kind of dragged him into it. Uh, he, <laughs> he, you know, because uh, I'd already made the deal with um, motion picture and television fun, and then I realized, oh my gosh, what have I done? I can't do this alone. And even though we have a group of people, but this was a different ball game, and so. I spoke to Michael and said, I'm going to be doing this. Would you like to be my partner? And he went, yeah, sure. You know, and he said later on, he thought, I never knew how much work this was going to be mm. uh, or, nor how much, how much fun it was going to be and, and how satisfying it was going to be. And, um, and I don't know if, if he would have known if he would have agreed. I don't know. Now see, he designed that. He designs pretty much all of our graphics. And Very nice. I love it. Yeah, I love it too. It's I love it because you know what we do. Um, so people realize is we do original scripts from classic radio plays from the twenties through the forties, even a bit in the fifties and the sixties, before radio just stopped doing uh, radio yeah. plays. And and um, we but we use our actors, so we reenact these radio plays, but we do them, we call it radio you can see, because you see us. It's not, you just don't listen to it. You see us and you see our costumes and our effect and, 
and everything. And and it's really it's really quite fun. I mean, I even enjoy watching them. You know, I was watching the Bickersons the other day, which I've seen probably 50 times during post-production. And I started laughing out loud and, and I directed it and I play a little tiny part in it. But um, you'd think I would, I would get kind of tired of it and not, but no, I'm still laughing out loud because it's so funny. And the Bickersons, for those people who are not familiar with the Bickersons, was a couple, a married couple, the Bickersons, and they bickered all the time. And so, really? the Bickersons. And um, it was played, those two roles were played for 20 years by Donna Michi, who was a big film star of the era, and Francis Lanford, who was a, a very popular big band singer and actress. They did it for 20 years, starting in radio, moving to um, uh, TV specials and and um, short-lived uh, kind of series. They even did comedy albums. And even in the 60s, there was, they were doing skits of the Bickersons on variety shows. So 20 years they did that. Obviously, our actors are a lot younger and, um, and contemporary. One, we have two wonderful, wonderful young actors playing those roles. You and go through a whole casting process. How do you find the actors? We cast from within, from our group. And, um, and, and because we have, I think we have 15, I think we have 15 members now. And, um, and everybody's very versatile. And also what we, what we have done, and see, we're in season two now. We, we just, the Bickersons is episode one of season two. So a lot of things changed and upgraded uh, in season two, uh, because season one, which was nine episodes, was um, different. Uh, we didn't have a lot of the facilities, a lot of the advantages that we, we have now. We now have, hello, hi, Pam. Uh, we now have a, a very, uh, very uh, wonderful costumer, Hollywood costumer, who has a huge costume house. And so he's doing our costumes now. As of as of the Bickersons, and we we did our own costumes from you know Beg Borrow Steel uh, in the first season. Then we did pretty good, but nothing can compare to a, a really professional Hollywood costumer. And we uh, we've just done a lot of upgrading. We've done a lot of upgrading technologically. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, and um, at things that you you wouldn't know, but we know and uh, things that give it a different look and I, I think a nicer look. And, and then we became a SAG uh, signatory, which means uh, Michael and I are uh, producers and we, and we now have um, operate under a SAG contract, which is great, really, really great. And because of our category, there are certain categories within the union that even though we're on strike, we can keep shooting and we can promote our shows. And that's true with a few categories like commercials, like audiobooks, things like that. And, uh, and we fall under um, a category where we can keep shooting and we can keep promoting. So we're very lucky because that would be really a tragedy if we couldn't, considering that we're raising money for an organization, there you go, MPTF, that is helping people who are suffering from the strike, you know, not just the actors, but as I said before, from all walks of life and industry. And they, and they were already helping uh, the writers because the writers have been on strike for, I think this is their third month. Yeah. So they're, they're suffering. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I think that's beautiful of you, Lee, to do that, you know, to be so selfless and, and the, the team that you work with to want to do this. I mean, as we've mentioned, um, you know, people can do their research. Uh, you've done so much in television and film and stage. You have this extraordinary body of work, incredible career, love it. And, uh, and, and people love you for it. You. you could easily say, you know, I'm just going to relax at the beach. I've done what I've had to do. Instead, you want to you know, meet these challenges head on and, and do it through 
the art form itself, the, the method of entertainment to reach and inspire and entertain people enough to where hopefully they can then um, donate and help so more great entertainment is created down the line. I think it's a very beautiful thing that you're doing, Lee. Thank you. I, I really do appreciate that. And, and we, you know, also like I know many people who have been helped by the Motion Picture and Television Fund. And I always say that they, they help people from prenatal to childcare to the rest of life and to the end of life, because that's what they do. And they have a, a, a very, very fine um, home uh, for people. Uh, the, the assisted living home and the nursing home and the memory yeah, care okay. unit, uh, very fine, the motion picture home. And, but that's just one aspect of what they do. But like, I know people who are in that home and I'd, I want them to have that. I don't want them to lose that. Well, hi there. Oh, good. Hi, Culver City, Eric Levitt. How are you? So I, I want people to, to be able to stay there where they're safe and they're cared for. And then they have, you know, terrific child care yeah. and, and health care and a wonderful hospital. And, you know, they really are all facets of helping, of helping people in need. And um, I really, oh, well, thank you for posting my website. And um, so I want them to be able to continue to do that. Who knows, I might need that. And, um, but I do know an awful lot of people who have, who have um, need, ha had needs that were helped by MPTF. So, I, I love I love doing that, and then also uh, we are, we feel Michael and I are radio nerds. We call ourselves uh, because we love um, radio plays, and and we never say old or old school or old time. We just say classic because these these shows are iconic, and if you've never seen them and you've never heard them, never heard of them, you are in for a treat because it's it's kind of where everything started because if you if you know much about and even if you don't about radio um, back in the golden age of radio the 20s 30s 40s um, that was it mm -hmm. you know you could go see a feature film which at that point were just transitioning into talkies uh, you could go see that if you had the quarter to spend and if you were near a theater you could see a stage play if you happen to live in a, in a city where there was a uh, theater. Um, but other than that, there was no streaming, there was no television, there, were no, there was nothing else, right? So on a Saturday night, the whole family would gather around this big, beautiful piece of furniture, a yes. console that had a radio in it. And uh, we're not old enough to remember that. I'm, I probably am, but but I never heard of it until really, I'll tell you a story about that. But they would gather around that and the shows were um, all kinds of different shows. You had variety shows and you had game shows and you had comedies and musicals and dramas and you know family shows and all kinds of different shows. And you know, at a certain hour, the kids would go to bed and you know, okay, little Johnny, you need to go to bed now. You you've watched Fiddler Wingy and Molly, or listened to it, and and now and then mom and dad were settled down for maybe something darker, like a detective show. And radio was really interesting because they could do things in radio that weren't done in early TV. It was it was it was darker. It was more interesting. It was sometimes brutal. Sometimes like kind of sexy and 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 that didn't happen in early tv so when these shows yeah, yeah even like war of the worlds i mean the, the reaction to that was extraordinary people still talk about that today well war of the worlds if you if you watch the show and you listen to my intro and war of the worlds i mean tom does the hosting part and then i come in because because i worked with orson wells when i was very young and in, in something that we can't talk about and um and um, and I was a huge fan of War of the Worlds. And I think my grandmother had a vinyl album, I think, because I, I listened to War of the Worlds like incessantly. I was 
completely fascinated by War of the Worlds. And it came out before I was born. But later, because it, it's had so many different iterations. You know, it's had, my gosh, you know, big movies, big blockbuster movies. It's had uh, series. It's had international series and and American series. And it's had even an opera. And mm. even a portion of it was used in um, a heavy metal album. And I forget the group, but some very famous I forget who, um, heavy metal group. And so it had many different iterations, but we wanted to do the original 1938 script that aired on October 31st, 1938. And I wanted to direct it. Everybody thought I was crazy because how can you possibly, it's such a big production. How can you possibly do it on Zoom? And on radio, you can see, how can you possibly do it? And that poster is designed by my partner, Michael, which I think is a really good poster. Quite quite scary when you really look at it. It is. Um, That's tr that was true radio when they said radio was really theater of the mind. That yes. really, truly uh, proved that. Just oh, it actually, did. And how the public reacted, too, thinking everything was the real deal. Well, if you listen to my intro, it, there's it, it, two schools of thought on that in radio historians. And one says, oh, absolutely, millions of people ran into the streets and died and, and uh, tried to get away and drowned and whatever, right? And then you have, oh, oh, there you go. Yeah, listened on vinyl. We listened, yeah, we did the same thing. Yep. Um, so, but then you have the other school of thought of the other half of the historians and they say, no, that is impossible. And that it was millions of people because at that time, like we have the Nielsen ratings now, they had, um, I forget the name of the company, but they had a company that did, uh, that rated radio shows so that advertisers could look at this and see where they wanted to put their money, just like in network television. And, um, and they, they saw that, because there were many channels, and um, Edgar Bergen, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy oh, yeah. playing opposite. Father of Edgar, Candace Bergen. Uh, Father of Candace Bergen. Yeah. And that was playing opposite of, of Mercury Theater, Orson's, Orson's Theater Company that did War of the Worlds. And then on another, on another entirely, there was another very popular show playing. So they said it's not possible that that number of people was listening to War of the Worlds. It's been exaggerating. And then what came out? And, and anyway, I'm kind of being redundant because when you see, it, you will, you will but see it's my terrific uh, sort of backstory information for everybody you're sharing. It, well, the, the, I mean, I find that to be so fascinating about every single show. Do you love doing the research and digging I deep? I love doing the research. I, I, I've always loved research. As an actress, I'm a big yeah. researcher. And but then also as a, now as a producer, director, writer, you know, I'm I'm a, a avid, avid researcher because you find out things that yes. you know, because I thought, oh, that's true. You know, everybody ran to the streets and blah blah blah. Well, maybe, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe a hundred people, but it certainly wasn't millions of people. But then also there was a person with an agenda, and that was William Randolph Hearst. And he was the most powerful newspaper man in the country. He owned most of the major newspapers. And if you haven't heard of him, mm -hmm. think of Jeff Bezos. He was as yeah. powerful yeah. as Jeff Bezos. And he hated Orson Welles. And the reason he hated Orson Welles was because radio was the only and the major competitor to newspapers because radio did news and they can do it quicker than newspapers. So the next day there were foot high headlines that came out saying that, you know, Orson Welles is responsible for all these people dying because his broadcast it was all William Randolph Hearst. So then Orson just a couple of years later got back at him because he made Citizen Kane. And Citizen Kane was modeled on William Randolph Hearst. And he hated that movie, Citizen Kane, which is one of the greatest movies of all time. And um, so it, so a lot, so there was a lot of controversy and what is true and what isn't true about what really happened 
when people watched or watched, see, I'm stuck in that, listened to War of the Worlds, what really happened. And it's, it's, a, it's a controversy. Orson Welles was one of the greats, wasn't he? Just the way he thought, uh, extraordinary. I love seeing his interviews, you know, which they have, of course, online when he's on Merv Griffin and Mike Douglas and Dick Cavett and some of the other iconic hosts who we revere. And just um, some of the, the backstories that he talks about, he it was always straightforward, too, in his his presentation, which he was, was amazing. Blunt. He was yes. very Yes. He was really blunt. That's and, the word, right. And I don't think that Hearst liked that. Because right. he was he was used to people, you know, being sycophants to him. And Orson was nobody's puppet. And and when he when Orson did War of the Worlds, simultaneously he was a big Broadway producer. I don't think a lot of people know that. But he had there he is. He had uh, three hit Broadway shows playing simultaneously yes. when War of the Worlds aired. And I didn't know that before. And I worked with him. But it's not like I knew everything. He was, you know, he was a force before I was ever around. And he was just, he was a genius. He was um, a person before his time. And yeah. he peaked really. Yeah. And, but he was, uh, I just really admire him. So that's why I wanted to do, it's a long story, about why I wanted to do Orson Welles and everybody thought I was crazy. And about halfway through doing it, I thought I was crazy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, how are we going to pull this off? Because, yeah. you know, we do radio, you can see. And so a lot of the things, a lot of the uh, segments that you see in War of the Worlds you know, we had to figure out how to visualize those things that in 1938, in the original broadcast, you only heard them. So when you heard the orchestra playing, it was just Orson playing a vinyl record, right? But we had to somehow visualize it and we had to dig for about two or three months and try to find that piece of music that was playing in the show, but we had to find a film clip of it and of people dancing. And there were about, I forget, four or five different instances like that. Every single one was different. And we dug and we dug and we dug. And and really, Michael, you know, he really found, I found things and was sent to him and he would say, no, mm, won't work, won't sync. Because you had to sync it. You, so you don't think about things like that when you're just watching a show. But when you are producing the different layers of it, it's like, oh, right, we have to make sure that the music, that the footsteps of the dancers, the movements of the dancers that you're going to see mm -hmm. actually hit the beat. Right. And, and which they didn't have to do when they just do radio. So it, I, I did truly really think I'd lost my mind about halfway through, like, oh my gosh. Um, it's amazing, and, isn't it? It is. It really is amazing on, on so many different levels. Somebody else, too, that was near and dear to your heart in, in terms of the rapport and the incredible uh, mentor that he was for you, Steve McQueen, right? Yeah, there, there we are. Oh, my gosh. We were so young. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tell, how did you guys meet? Was it on a project or was it just uh, socially? Um, How did you guys initially meet? No, no, we didn't. No, we didn't meet socially. I, of course, there's a lot I can't say because of the yeah. rules. Can't say the projects, but, right? But I, yeah, but I was, um, I was asked to audition, and I was, I had never done a film. I had, I had, I was actually under contract. No, I was going under contract to a particular studio for a particular project, uh, which would have been my first um, TV show. And, but then I, but before I signed anything, I got a call from uh, my commercial agent, which was very unusual. I didn't have a theatrical agent. So it wasn't, and in those days and now, you know, your commercial agent doesn't submit you for feature films. They submit you for commercials. 
But my commercial agent called me up, who was a very wonderful guy and really watched out for me. I was very young and he was worried. <laughs> I was going to get in trouble or whatever. And so um, he called me and he said, there's this project you should audition for. And I said, no, not ready because I was studying and studying you know, film acting and so forth. And, um, and he kept persisting for about two weeks. And I, he said, I just really think you should. And I'm like, no, I'm afraid I'll fail. I'm not ready. He said, you won't fail anyway. So I, I did go audition because he, he really insisted I was right for it. And I auditioned for it. And it was a really grueling uh, series of auditions. There was, they started off with 500 um, young actresses um, in the mix and I did, I think, I think I did five auditions as they were, uh, you know, culling, you know, the actresses and so it's pretty brutal business. And, and um, so I made it to the second cut and then I made it to the third cut and there was about 200, maybe 150. And then um, I get a call on a Saturday um, saying I needed to go to the studio and, um, and I, and I had come in from from gardening. I was, we were talking about gardening. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, and I was dirty and sweaty and had dirt under my fingernails and my hair was, you know, hanging down and dressed in old jeans. And uh, they said, uh, oh, we need you to come over to the studio, which wasn't that far. And um, and I said, okay, give me an hour. I'll take a shower. And, I, and they said, no, you have to come in 10 minutes. If you don't come in 10 minutes, it won't be good. And I'm like, Fine, I'll be there in ten minutes. I think I was there in eight. Um, I literally jumped in my my old beater car and drove over because I thought, oh, I know, I'm just going to pick up some sides. And for those of you who don't know what sides are, those are uh, pages of their scenes from the script. And but you just you're just giving uh, scenes, which are called sides, which are pages. I don't know why they're called sides. I've never known. Right. And um, and you just work and write, Jim, and you just work on those. Right. And so I thought, oh, I'm because I knew that audition four was coming up. I had already been told that I was, you know, progressing. This was kind of like American Idol. It's like really rough. And um, so I went over and um, and I thought, oh, I'm, nobody will see me. Uh, there'll be a, somebody at reception. That'll be it closing early it's a saturday and i'll just run up the stairs because i knew the building very well by this time and and i'll just pick up those sides off of the receptionist desk and I'll run out right so i run up the stairs and i yank open the door and i'm like oh uh, because there was steve mcqueen and standing there and now mind you i wasn't a, a scared girl and um i had i had lived through a lot and also, Steve was of my parents' generation. So to me, he was an older person. And I mean, he was, oh my gosh, 40-something, really ancient. And um, and he said, oh, hi, I'm Steve. I, and I was like, yes, I know that. I saw Bullet. And um, <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't seen a lot of his movies. I think I'd only seen Bullet. And, uh, but all oh, my parents, you know, over the moon, you know that I was being considered for this and Steve McQueen was producing it for his company. And um, he said, you know, why don't we talk? And I said, sure. And we talked for, we went back to his office. We sat, we talked, everything was on the up and up, nothing weird. And we talked for about three hours. It was a great conversation. And we just bonded. And we talked about everything from motorcycles. Cause I rode, my, I had a motorcycle, rode a motorcycle. And of course he was a fantastic writer and fast cars, which I couldn't afford, but I liked, and um, life and our childhoods, which had interesting similarities in, in, in certain ways, re really interesting. And just everything, acting and film and all of that. And um, I, I kind of knew I was being tested. I kind of figured I was. But I was just myself and we just talked freely and then left and I did my fourth audition and then I was told I had made it through, you know, that hurdle and um, and it was down to the final five and um, and so forth. But that was how I met Steve was on that Saturday morning. 
And then I got the film and, um, and then I, I got the call from you know, the, my agent saying, you got the film. And I'm, he was like, I told you so. <laughs> yeah, well, you were right. And then I, and then the next call I got was from Steve. And he said, you know, great. Welcome aboard. I'm so happy. You were so great. Yeah, there it is. Yep. Oh, Vernon Scott. Yep. Incredible, huh? It was pretty incredible. What was that feeling like for you? Yeah. That kind of surreal. And um, I was a kind of a cocky, confident, you know, young, young actress. And, uh, but this was way beyond my, <laughs> my expectations. And I, I thought you should take that down now because people can read the name and then I'll get in trouble with the union again. Yeah, so, can you? yeah, they probably you. need a real. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they well, need some strong readers. <laughs> strong readers. Yeah, you're right. You're. I'm. I'm just like hyper vigilant. Um, and so he said, "So we're. You know, I'm going to work with you." I said, "Great." And because I was really like nobody from nowhere, and um, and so he did. And I would go over to the office all the time. And we would talk and he would, you know, I had, I had been studying acting like a, a maniac. I mean, I, I could act and uh, otherwise I wouldn't have gotten the job. And, but he taught me things I didn't know. You know, he taught me how to, oh my God, look at him. Look at him. Oh, nobody like him. Nobody like him. A real People force like, too, a force of nature. Yeah. yeah. He was a force of nature, but you know, in person, one on one, he was just a guy, yeah. you know, a brilliant, brilliant guy. But he was he was just uh, very down home. He was just a great guy. I miss him to this day. But um, so we just we would talk, and then at one point he said, "You need to gain some weight because I was I was a model and I was really skinny." And he said, you're too skinny for this role and you need to gain weight. And so he taught, told me how to gain weight and what I should eat. And then he said, and we're going to work out. And I got this fitness expert who's teaching me exercises and I'll teach them to you. And so I go to the office and, and we'd work out. And, um, and, uh, and I, I, all these moves were kind of like martial arts. And, you know, and I, I said to him one day, where do you learn all this? And he said, I got this martial arts teacher and I, I learned this from him and now I am teaching it to you. I said, great. Never asked his name, um, the uh, fitness guy. And then years later, because um, when I was being interviewed before a book, I'm in a lot of books about Steve. Um, and the interviewer said, you don't know who that was? And I said, no, I never asked. And Steve never mentioned his name. He said, it was Bruce Lee. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, okay. So I, w I guess I was trained one person removed by Bruce Lee. Yeah, that's cool. So, you know, it was it was an incredible experience, and uh, I learned so much from him about life and work and art. And he knew he knew a lot. He was a very well-rounded person. He was a great father. He met his kids, and you know, they would come to the office once in a while. And and he was he was just a a great guy. Really a great guy. And he did a lot for me. He changed my life. Which is incredible, you know. Um, when you have somebody that uh, has left that kind of impression on you, um, it sticks oh with you God. for the rest of your life, right? All my life. I mean, I, you know, my father had died uh, when I was a small child. And um, my stepfather, um, he just didn't have time for me. And... Um, there was no, and my, my grandfathers were gone. I had no brothers. Uh, you know, I really didn't have that father figure that would have been really helpful and really useful in my life until Steve. And um, even though our association was uh, finite, you know, because I'm, I moved to London later um, and he was, he was doing other things and, but he left an impression on me that uh, will never go away. And um, to this day, I do some of those exercises. And, you know, it's like, he was the best. 
He was he was the best. He's hearing you say that, you know. He's he's up there hearing that. <laughs> he's hearing that. That's why you have had no interruptions with your Wi-Fi. Because he's up there making sure that the signal is coming through loud and clear. See? <laughs> well, we have to explain that to the audience. That I had, so far, so good. Well, I had told Jim before I was having Steve's a lot spirit of spirit is all around. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. I'd love that. But I told Jim I was having a lot of problems with my Wi-Fi. My picture freezes. Up in the mountains and, there in California. Because I live in the mountains and... Um, and we all complain about the Wi-Fi and uh, it just, I have done extraordinary measures. I even have a mini cell tower in my office yeah. and, and we have the best and the greatest and the fastest of internet and whatever. And, and sometimes during an interview or, or a, a Zoom meeting, it'll freeze five, six, seven, eight times and I have to restart. And it's been a really, honestly, Jim, that was interesting you pointed that out because that, it never goes this smoothly. Ha. Huh. Thank you, Steve. So Steve and I had a conference, McQueen and oh, Masters okay. had a conference and, and I'm a Libra, so I'm balanced and harmony. So I'm trying to make oh, sure that great. everything is balanced uh, <laughs> with Virgo rising. So everything's organized, but oh. balanced. And Oh my gosh, come to my Steve. house and help me out, please. <laughs> you have some closets that need to be rearranged. Oh my, God, my whole house, you know, because I am a double Gemini. I'm a, I'm a Gemini with a Gemini rising. And so, you know, at any given time, any of the four of me will show up. So, yeah, come to my house. I mean, I don't think Geminis are renowned for their organizational skills. <laughs> part of me likes like a, likes, likes a nice, everything organized. But the other part of me is like, oh, I don't want to do that. I'd rather go and write something. Or exactly. Play a piano or... With the Hollywood players, the radio players, how um, how often for the audience watching, because I know they're excited, they're going to say, we're going to check it all out, which is great. Okay. Thanks, uh, JMS Lovities. We appreciate that. How right. often are the productions done? Something new, something new? Because it takes a while just to put the one together. It takes it takes two to three months to put one together. So um, before we got to season two, we were, we were, we were able to do one a month, but now that we have so many upgrades, um, we can't. So I I'm going to guess um, every two months probably. But if you like and subscribe on the, on our YouTube channel, if you just like and subscribe, then you will get a notice. And don't worry, they don't they don't sell you know that to anybody. You just get a a notice. You know, Hollywood Radio Players has a new show up. And that's it. Right. It's a, um, that's why I tell everybody with this show too, it's important to subscribe to the channels because that helps yeah. get more people to see it. It doesn't cost anything to do that. Oh, and free. click the notification bell so you're alerted yeah. when there's new content, new yes. episodes, new shows. Yeah, it's very really important and easy it to is. do. Yeah, and thank you for explaining that. I don't explain it nearly as well <laughs> as, as you do. Um, but yeah, just do that, and then you will uh, you will be notified. And right now we have ten up, so yeah, you know, that's quite a few to go through. Some are some are long, and some are like the Bickersons is I believe eleven minutes. It's really quick. It's a quick, fast comedy. But then War of the Worlds, I'm not sure exactly how long it is anymore. I think it's an hour, something like that. The Life so, of Riley, The Hitchhiker, yeah. Hitchhiker is, I really am fond of The Hitchhiker. Uh, I did not direct that one. I play uh, kind of a medium-sized role in it. Uh, but I like that. Uh, that was our Halloween show because it is a thriller. It is a ghost story. And the backstory on The Hitchhiker is pretty interesting. It was such a popular show that uh, on radio that then The Twilight Zone... Um, got permission to do it on on the Twilight Zone. So uh, even though it's, of course, visual on the Twilight Zone and audio only on the radio show, but that is a really spooky story. Uh, I really am fond of that. And then Life of Riley, of course, that's one of those shows. It started on radio and then it went, transitioned into early television. And um, William... See, once I write the research, it's out of my head. 
But William Bendix yes. uh, played, played Riley, although there was another person that played Was Riley. it uh, Jackie Gleason for a little bit? Yes. Gleason. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you know your, you know your stuff. Um, yeah, Jackie Gleason very, very briefly. And then uh, Bendix uh, transitioned into the TV show and, of course, became early TV, early, early, uh, became a huge TV star uh, be because of that. But he had also done some very interesting films, some a, a very um, really good drama. And then uh, War of the Worlds we discussed. Yeah. And then um, Gunsmoke we discussed. And can you scroll? Yeah, we'll scroll back to uh, some of the others. So you got War of the Worlds, The Hitchhiker, The Life of Riley, Our Miss Brooks. Our Miss Brooks, Our Miss Brooks. Yeah. And we did discuss that briefly. Father it's a very funny show. Uh, Father Knows Best is an Father Knows Best is an interesting show because the Christmas show, yeah. Well, on on radio, uh, Father Knows Best, and again, like I mentioned, um, Robert Young recast it for TV. But uh, Father Knows Best on radio was very different than Father Knows Best on TV because Father Knows Best on, in early TV was very uh, early Americana, it was his happy family. You know, if anything went wrong, it was something like, um, uh, uh, thank you, monks. Thank you very much. Um, it was, it was lovely some, on the gym master show, Lee, as you know, <laughs> we kept, like I said, we kept the porch light on for you. I love it. I'm going <laughs> to, every week you'll hate me, but, <laughs> but father knows, father knows best on radio. Uh, was not like uh, in uh, television, which was all very uh, clean and, and tidy yeah, and, wholesome and, and, and wholesome, right? No, in radio, um, he would talk about Robert Young's character, uh, Jim. He would talk about um, how awful his children were and um, and that they just wouldn't do anything. And, and he would complain. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and you never, sort of, never, it was never. Sort of harsher, yeah. Well, harsher, much harsher. And and much more realistic, yeah. Um, but not not so in in television. And a lot of those shows were like that. Gunsmoke was like that. I mean, you you know, they talked about uh, murder. There were shows about murder, and and there was not always a happy ending. Where in the TV show, of course, yes, there were killings and so forth because it was a western, but it was uh, very cleaned up, and there was always a resolve at the end. Not so on uh, radio, which is one of the reasons I like radio a lot is, yeah. is because the scripts are much uh, deeper, much deeper than the scripts for early television. Tell us about uh, the choices of the hosts too. You and I were talking about uh, Tom Bergeron and I remember Tom Bergeron hosting People are talking on WBZ Channel oh Four, my gosh, Boston, yes. the talk show, yes. and also the Fox Morning Show as well that he had co-hosted. And then, of course, Hollywood Squares, Dancing with the Stars, and we Two had Emmys. yes, we had John Davidson on, who was a friend of the show, and John opened up this wonderful venue in New Hampshire called Club Sandwich which is in Sandwich, New Hampshire. And it's a wonderful oh. venue where John performs on the weekends, but he brings oh. in all of this terrific talent from musicians to right. comedians to actresses and actors and performers. And it's really fantastic. And it's open uh, from like June-ish to October in the Lakes <laughs> region of New Hampshire. And Tom did a wonderful like uh, promo together they were sort of teasing each other. It was a lot of fun as uh, John Davison was opening up Club Sandwich. Just uh, Tom is one of those great guys that reminds me of like a Dick Clark and some of the others where you could, which I've always patterned myself after as well as a on-air broadcast host. You can plug Tom in anywhere. Yes. Ryan, Ryan Seacrest is kind of like that as well. You can mm -hmm. plug him in anywhere. And he can get the job done. He can yes. host game shows, talk shows, news programs, entertainment programs. Competition and, and, shows. And I, mean, I come can... from the same line of experience and training where we were trained to be 
versatile, know something about everything, and also be respectful and know what everybody else around you is doing on set or in yes. studio because everybody plays a role and it takes a team to pull it all off. And, uh, and a lot of effort behind the scenes with, and everybody has a purpose and everybody has a reason for being there. So I've always admired Tom's, um, his personality and the warmth he exudes with the quick wit. Um, so yeah. And he was host uh, originally. Tell us about uh, working with Tom. Well, it was. Tom didn't ask me to say anything I just said. <laughs> I'm Comes from the heart. I'm going to call him. I'm going to that's say, you know, how much is you pay Jim Masters? <laughs> right, that's right. Um, well, we'll make some calls and hopefully we can get him on the show. I would love it. <laughs> you should have him on the show. He's a great, um, just a great guest. I'm I'd sure. love to talk shop with him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, of course. I mean, you're of a younger generation, but uh, but you do have a similar track. And and that that would be that would be really fun, I think, for you to talk about. So I hope you hope you do. So um, it, it was interesting how it came about because when we, we, we kind of looked at it and said, do we need a host? Because we didn't want to just, you know, press a button and you, and you see the show. We wanted to have an introduction and I didn't want to do them. And Michael didn't want to do them because we don't do that. And um, I did the one, well, I did two actually, I'll tell you about that in a minute. But I did the one for, um, for War of the Worlds because and that was my pet project and I had known Orson and, and so forth. Right. And I really wanted to pay homage to Orson. And um, so then we were like debating, like, do we need a host? I mean, I think we need a host. I think we need, well, who could be a host? I don't know. And, and the thing is the way it happened was that when we performed live uh, back in the days, pre pandemic, uh, we had done a Maltese Falcon live. Now I was not in that one, but Michael directed it. And Tom, and this this shows you kind of interesting, because at that time for for the live shows that we were doing, um, it was open to any SAG after member to audition. We we cut it off at a hundred. That was our cap because we just couldn't handle anymore. So if you signed up and you were in the first hundred, then you could come in and you could audition for our show we were doing. And somebody looked down at our sign-in sheet and said, "You what? Is that is that like the Tom Bergeron?" And everybody said, "Oh no, it can't be you know it can't be Tom Bergeron. It's going to audition." And um, but the thing is, is that what we all know is that within the union there can only be one Tom Bergeron, and whoever gets the name first and becomes a union member, that's your name. If another Tom Bergeron comes along, and that was his name since birth, and his parents named that, he's named after his five great grandfathers, right? It doesn't make any difference. You got to change your name to George Bergeron or something. And so we all knew that it was the Tom Bergeron. And so he came in uh, wearing a fedora hat, and um, he auditioned, and he was brilliant. That's Tom. And he uh, got the role of Sam Spade, and he was great. He was incredible. And so Michael directed him in that. And so um, Michael, um, when we were discussing this, this, you know, problem of the host, Michael said, well, why don't we just get Tom Bergeron? And I said, oh, okay. And then we also knew that Tom Bergeron had a very deep connection to motion picture and television fund starting when he was 16 years old. And that's another story for another day. Very good story though. And so we uh, asked uh, MPTF, would you like it if we use Tom Bergeron's host? And we'd love that. Oh yes, wonderful, wonderful. Which one wants to call him? Oh no, no, you call him. And we said, okay, no problem. We don't have problems calling anybody. So Michael called Tom Bergeron and Tom Bergeron said, of course. I'd love to do that. And so he became our host for almost the entire first season, seven, seven of our shows before then he, he ended up, um, you know, working on this movie that he's actually, I think he's co-writing or came from an idea. Somehow he's involved in the whole creation of it. He's not just 
playing a role in it. And so he became our host and, um, and he's just, he's just fantastic. Just, just fantastic. And just big hearted, good cheer. And when you listen to his, his intros, I do, I did write, cause I read all the intros, as I said, but I, I did write in one of the intros, um, a very brief um, story, even though it's a very long story normally, about how he got involved with the Motion Picture and Television Fund when he was 16 years old. And because remember, it's been around for 100 years. So, you know, lots of us have been involved for a very long time. Somebody and, wrote a letter involving the Three Stooges or something, he, right? He did. It's, I want you to hear his because I yeah. can't tell. Yeah, I can't tell I, I saw him say that, and I was like, "Holy mm -hmm. cow, that's fantastic! What a great story!" Yeah, uh, a very, very capsule version, but do listen to him tell the story. It's amazing. Um, capsule version. He was a huge fan of the Three Stooges. He was a a a baby journalist. He wanted to be a journalist. He'd never done anything. Yes, I do too, Marilyn. And um, and he uh, his parents were gone for the weekend. And so in those days, of course, if you made long distance call, it cost you money. Yes. But, so, yes. But he didn't pay the phone bill. His parents did. Yeah. So <laughs> and, and he, tells, he tells his story much better than I do. So he started calling around California and he was in on the East Coast. And so that's that's a very expensive call. And he. Yes, it is. I think he made many calls trying to find. Uh, I think it was Larry. He was trying to find her the Three Stooges. And he finally found out that Larry was in the motion picture home uh, from the motion picture and television fund. And he was recovering from a, an operation or something. And so he called and again, I tell the story very poorly, but if you listen, you'll, you'll hear him tell the story. And he called the motion picture and television. Said, Can I speak to Larry Fine, please? Just because he's 16, you know, you don't have any back off at 16. You just do what comes to your mind. And, Thank goodness for that, because otherwise we'd all be, you know, sitting in a ditch somewhere. But um, so he called and and the and the woman that answered the phone at the home said, um, oh, he's playing poker right now. He's got a really good hand. Can he call you back? A said, really good hand. Yeah. <laughs> well, she, she was a comedian herself. <laughs> it was true. It was true. It was that totally is. true. And and Larry Fine. Either he called Larry Fine back in half hour, or Larry Fine called him. I see he knows the story better than you. And um, and he said, "Can I interview you? I'm writing a story, or something, a school paper, I think, or something." And he said yes. And he recorded it, and he still has some of those recordings, and he has actually played them on the Howard Stern show. And and then he said, "Is there any way I can reach Mo? Because at the third uh, douche was, I believe, already passed on." And so Larry Fine gave him Mo's number at his home. And so this 16 year old kid called up Mo and said, hi, I'm Tom Bergeron, could I interview you? And he's like, who, who are you? And he said, well, Larry gave me your number. He said, oh yeah, that Larry. And so he interviewed Mo. And so he has these recordings and I just, you know, we've been trying to figure out a show that where we could use them and, and we sort of have it figured out, but not entirely. But anyway, so that's a long way of answering how did we get Tom to be our host? And, and it was through Maltese Falcon, which when we do the virtual version, which is in our pipeline, I don't know exactly when we're doing it. I hope this year, but um, Tom has already agreed that he's going to reprise Sam Spade. Wow. So, yeah, and he's going to use Michael's hat because Michael has a huge collection of hats. And and he actually used Michael's fedora hat, not for the audition, of course, but for the actual uh, live production. And he really likes Michael's hat. So he's going to wear Michael's hat. And that's how we got Tom Bergeron. That is incredible, huh? It was what incredible. A, what a great story. And, and we did not know at the time about his connection to NPTF. We didn't know. And like you said, it was at an early age. It was, you know, what, it was like 16 or something like that. 16. Yeah. And we did not know he did that. We did not know we had a connection to MPTF. And once we got to know him, you know, and then he told us 
and that he has done a lot of fundraising for them and this and that. And that that's how he got Tom. Out of his love for the, the Three Stooges, which is which is absolutely amazing, huh? <laughs> Who would guess? That's I mean, it. So, so strange. It's serendipity, but I find life is like that. Absolutely right. Yes, absolutely. And um, so, like we mentioned, Tom is uh, off doing his thing with pre-production and all, but Lisa Gibbons, another wonderful, oh iconic host, fabulous uh, entertainment personality and, and a giver, uh, a Total true giver. giver of you know, yeah. many causes she believes in and yeah. really, really beautiful person. Um, you tapped her and she was available to, to step in as well, huh? That's fantastic. Yeah, we got really lucky. Um, it's a, yes. a, totally, a totally different story. Um, neither of us knew Lisa. And I don't think I was ever interviewed by Lisa for Entertainment Tonight. I don't, I don't think so. Um, but neither of us knew her. And, but uh, my publicist, whom you know, Harlan Ball, mm -hmm. did. And so I said, you know, we, we need a female host. Tom is, has to leave. And I'd really love to have Lisa Gibbons. And so he put, um, this time it was me, he put me in touch with Lisa. And, um, you know, it didn't take much. She said yes. And, and, uh, and so she's our host now. And we hope she'll continue forever. And or as long as she wants, and uh, and she's just I can't say enough good things about her. She has her own charitable organization, and um, Lisa cares, or is it? Uh, I hate to not remember this. Anyway, she has her own charitable organization. Michael and I, and our respective spouses, went to um, a an event for them uh, recently, and to support Lisa, and that was great. And um, and she's, I, I really, you can't say enough good things about her. She's just the warmest, friendliest, biggest heart, charming, uh, funny, just the adjectives could go on from here till Sunday and just wonderful. I mean, look at her smile. I mean, she's just, yeah. genuine. she's totally genuine. And she. Uh, Lisa's Care Connection. Thank you. Lisa's Care Connection. And that is a great organization that, um, connects uh, caregivers uh, with people with Alzheimer's Yeah. Um, uh, with um, she helps the family members because some, I know because uh, my mother had Alzheimer's and one of my best and dearest friends and my cousin's husband, who was like a brother. And then, uh, so we all kind of bonded because Michael had a family member who had Alzheimer's. Lisa's mother had Alzheimer's. Another friend of who was at this uh, entertaining at this event, yes. her her mother had Alzheimer's, on and on and on. Right, so many people have have that situation, and um, so so we like to support her organization as well, because I remember when my mother got Alzheimer's, and and they lived in another state, so there wasn't a lot I could do. But what I did try to do was connect them with people who could help. And Lisa's organization was not uh, around then. I wish it had, been. but you know, eventually we did uh, kind of, you know, feel our way through that. And um, so I think it's very important because when you have a family member who gets uh, Alzheimer's, it is like what you don't know what to do. You, I mean, my mother got Alzheimer's in uh, late, late. She got late onset Alzheimer's. Very fortunate. Um, and she passed away in 2014. So I, she was only, she only had Alzheimer's for just a few years because it was towards the end of her life. And, um, but then I, I have had, I, I know people who've had early onset Alzheimer's and that is, uh, I think a very tragic, it's all tragic, but I think it's more tragic in a, in a way to get it earlier than later because the, I, that's just how I feel about it. Oh, and, absolutely, because yeah, you're robbed uh, earlier, right, in life. And it's, uh, you know, you mentioned, I've interviewed professionally, actually, my work in television and radio. Um, one of the things is folks, too, who have been the caretakers of 
anybody who's had a situation in their life, whether it's a family member who fell ill for any reason, or there's a disability or something just an accident. Happened. And sometimes you're, you're not prepared to be the caregiver. Sometimes yeah. it's through osmosis. Sometimes it's, you know, you're the oldest in the family or whatever it may be. And it's amazing. I interviewed somebody in Florida who was very involved in that world in supporting the caregivers because the caregivers, yeah. They're putting their life on hold. They're worrying. They're they're managing the finances. They're, you know, making sure the food's ready, and they're not even taking care of themselves oftentimes. Yeah. And they're worn out, and they're worried, and they're scared, and a lot of times financially drained as well. And there are times where the caregiver, because of the overwhelm and the stress, passes before the person they're even caring. Yeah. And 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 the. I know this particular woman I interviewed where she had a situation where her husband, mm. where, where her mother had Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and then her husband no. developed it and she was caring for both simultaneously oh, God. And, oh. uh, and they both had since passed. And then she was getting so many comments from people with similar situations yeah. saying there's no support system. There's no, help for the caregiver. Well, that's and, what Lisa's organization does. Which is incredible, right? Yeah, it connects the caregivers to resources. And I think it's a very important organization. And and the fact that she already has her own organization, but was willing to help us raise money for MPTF, I think it just shows who she is. You know, yeah. she's an incredible, uh, incredible human being. She really is. Yeah, you've gone from Tom to Lisa, two fabulous people. And yeah, very lucky. I mean, how do we get so lucky? I don't know. But, <laughs> but we're just, you know, we're, we're getting to do what we love, you know, which is yes. create. And we're getting to raise money for an organization that we love. And, and we have had, you know, two hosts that we love. So I don't know. We're just, uh, we're just lucky. It's the thing. Yeah. The luck is on your side. Absolutely. Yeah. Why do you love this so much, Lee? You've been doing this for quite some time. And again, you've got this wonderful body of work. People just love chatting with you and just love, you know, your energy and your compassion for others. What is it about it that keeps you plugged in, connected and, and the blessings and joys in your life that inspire you to continue to create the art for the enjoyment and betterment of all of us. Wow. That's like a big fat question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a deep Pak Chopra type question, right? That, oh man. <laughs> that, Lama? that is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, do, now do you mean Hollywood radio players specifically? Do you mean, can you, well, you narrow that down just a tad? Well, overall, just in terms of the longevity and the passion and thirst for the work that you still have. And then you can, if you want to tie in the radio players as being part of that, growing yes. out of that yes. passion. Of course. Yeah. And the blessings in your life that keep you uh, wanting to stay connected with everybody. Well, that is a big fat question <laughs> still, but I'll try, I'll try to answer that. Um, I well, we figured uh, well the Wi-Fi is still working. Because right? uh, yeah. at any moment, Steve might go. Okay, as soon as she starts to answer it, done. fade to black. <laughs> fade to black. Oh, boy, that would be bad. Um, that would be very bad. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I feel like I have um, been very fortunate. In, I mean, I've had some really rough times, like everybody, but I feel like. I've been very fortunate in that I do exactly what I wanted to do at an extremely early age. I couldn't exactly explain it. I was three, you know, but, uh, but it just was there and performing was just present. And my mother said um, that I was on my to my tippy toes like, like if you're wearing point shoes, ballet yeah. shoes, you know, yeah. those who, you know, point shoes. Uh, yeah. Point shoes. I don't know what else to call them. Yeah. Uh, but she, she said, like this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
she said, I was on, I was on the tips of my toes dancing before I could actually walk. And so I think that is pretty illustrative of, of how this happened to me. And because I never really made a decision like uh, people uh, come from all different thought processes to do what they want to do. And some people, they have to like really think about it and research it. And I, it was just there for me. It fell in my lap. And then everything else, uh, of course, was just hard work. And so I, I can't get rid of it. <laughs> and I don't want to. Uh, because I do, I love all aspects of performing, whether it's doing, you know, a, a big budget feature film, whether it's doing Hollywood radio players, whether it's doing a reading someplace, I just I just love it all. And and there are things that I don't want to do anymore, and so I don't do those things. Uh, but I love to perform, and so it's all it's been a life of of that. And I just feel like I'm very fortunate because it came to me so early, and I never had to think, oh. Hmm, hmm. Should I talk to the guidance counselor and figure out? And although I did talk to the guidance counselor in my did hospital, you? well, we had to. We were made to, right? And I was like, sure, I'll do that. But I already know what I'm going to do. I'm already doing it. And and so you know, the guidance counselor did some kind of a test. I don't remember. And then so the guidance counselor said, well, according to the results of your of your test, your uh, career consultation test, you should be a performer or a carpenter. And it's like, oh, I think I picked performer. But the funny thing is that I really like carpentry. Yeah, there and is that creating and building and constructing and right. All of that. And I've, I don't do it anymore, but I used to have a whole set of uh, carpentry tools and used to do a lot of that. And I thought, you know, that guidance counselor actually was pretty good because even though I didn't end up being a carpenter professionally, like, Harrison Ford did, um, but before he became a movie star. But I, I did pairs around my house and did things like that, creative things, and um, and I've been a performer. So, does that answer your question? It was such a big fat question. It does, yeah, no, it does. It, it, it ties it beautifully, and then the passion for the craft and the art, the Hollywood radio players, and and celebrating these iconic productions of then and bringing them to life in the style that you are now with these wonderful actors and actresses and performers that you have believing in all of this. And again, to help the, uh, the fund as well is an extension of those blessings and joys and of that thirst and passion you have to stay collaborative, connected, joyful, and bring joy to others, right? Yes, yes. And you know, that you put it very, really very, very well. And I know a lot of people use the phrase give back, and I don't. I actually don't like that phrase. Um, it's just a personal quirk of mine. Uh, because some people don't actually have anything to give back. They never got anything, right? I think that give, just give. Just give. It is is a better uh, a better choice, at least it is for me. Um, even though I have certainly had ample uh, blessings, and but I just I like to help. I like to help others, and and I I've been that way since I was a child. And all of my mother's friends used to come to me and confide their problems to me, and I, and I think to myself, I'm eight. You know, I, I can't help her with her marriage or, or her illness or like old old soul inside. Yeah, yeah. But I was like eight or ten, yeah. and, 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 and you were the therapist. <laughs> I was the therapist, and like I didn't even know what to say. And, <laughs> but they would come and tell me their secrets, and um, and I would just listen and think I have no idea what to say to this grown person. Uh, but I'll just, I, I guess, I'll just be quiet and I'll listen and. So I think I just always had that. And then as I got older and older, it would happen in different places and like shoe stores 
and you know waitresses and would tell me their problems. And I think there it is again. And uh, and you know what? It's okay with me. I actually think that was a purpose of mine that I wasn't fully aware of. Was that <laughs> something you ever thought of? pursuing you know no. life life coaching or psychology no, no, no. or no, any no. of that work oh no i'm a performer no 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 thank you so but, the performance the art does provide healing and comfort and yes. joy to people yes i think yeah. that i really do think that i think you know you want to have a good laugh you know watch a comedy watch the bigger right. sense exactly you know, you're depressed you know uh go to a movie uh, or w watch one of our shows, uh, you know, and because there's always truth and beauty in performances. Yes. And I think that's, I think that is the secret to it is the truth and the beauty. And because why do people feel better after they've watched something that is funny or uplifting or that they can identify with? that, oh, look, that person in that show has the same problem I do. Mm -hmm. and, and so they don't feel so alone. Yeah, relatability, yeah. Relatability, you know, I mean, there's, we can't name any, but there, there are good sh shows out there. <laughs> shows out there. But there are shows that, you know, have impacted my life and mm -hmm. that you, are, and, and everybody's that you always remember. And, and there are books, I'm a huge reader, and there are books that, um, have have impacted my life that I, I read I read a book and I go you know that book just changed my life yeah and uh, and it's never too late it's never too late to to change your life or to enhance your life or to forgive yourself for something I mean that's kind of a tough one for me I'll, I'll beat myself up like all day long you know why did I say that why did I do that what and then I think stop just stop you know you can't go backwards so um uh, thank you, Kathleen. Thank you so much. Uh, you can't go backwards, and you have to keep going forwards. And that, that to me, is a is the main lesson. That's so true. It really, really is. Um, it, it's a beautiful thing when you have an opportunity to share with people and, and celebrate, you know, in the way that uh, you do and have done for so many years. Our viewers watching around the world commenting uh, in our Levity Hall chat room. Love loving you. the conversation, loving having you here. Thank you for being a gracious guest. She always is. You can always guarantee uh, with a few you. laughs at the same time. It's a perfect kind of conversation back and forth, which I absolutely love. And Me too. Uh, well, you're a great, you're a great one. You know, you're a great host and, um, and you're a great conversationalist and you're so um, easygoing. You know, there's no, there's no stress in it. There's no stress. Some people interview them, there's stress. Yeah. And, yeah. But with I, you, there's no stress. And it's just very relaxed and, and uh, kind. And that's, that's a, that's your great, your great attribute. I appreciate that. Yeah. We try to make it, we tell everybody, um, this is more of a conversational sort of format than just the typical interview. We don't rush people through, you know, if you have 20 minutes, half hour, hour, that's what we do. If you're having a good time and it's rolling along and you're enjoying it and you don't have a limo that's idling outside or toast burning my house, in the no. kitchen, <laughs> you know, then <laughs> we just, burning in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> then we just, uh, you know, chat and, and have a wonderful time and just uh, thoroughly uh, enjoy as we have and, and as our viewers have as well. You're welcome, Jen, watching in Pennsylvania and Christine in North Carolina as well. Oh, I was born says, in North Carolina, Christine. Giving a better understanding of the uh, strike as well by explaining that, which was kind. And uh, yeah, because people might not understand what that's all about now. Yeah, no, more think, of a... Yeah a little bit more of an understanding of it as well. And uh, yeah, gang, this is really something that you might not have known that uh, Lee has her hands in. It's really very, very cool. The Hollywood Radio Players, you can check it out. Again, it does benefit the Motion Picture and Television Fund where caring is infinite. And you can go uh, to the YouTube channel. You can also check out 
the website. And of course, you can check out Lee's website and see all the cool things she's done and she's involved in. And Lee, this was really always amazing. This was uh, round two and we're going to definitely <laughs> keep. <laughs> Maybe she's saying. Like part two. <laughs> I was going to say, round two, we're on the Gym Master Show. Everybody's a winner. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. That's it. Uh, but light, love, and levity, or the whole levity thing came out because I said the show, you know, during the crazy pandemic has a lot of light, love, and levity. And I stumbled once and I said, love and levity together too fast. And out of that word came oh, that's what levity. Means. And they all jumped on it. Everybody loves love the it. word. I and love levity. We need more of that, right? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, we for sure do. Well, I, I, uh, I think that you are doing that, Jim. I think you're putting it out there. And you're manifesting it, and um, and it's happening, and and that's great. You are a tremendous host. You're really good at what you do, and it's my great pleasure to be here again. Thank you so much for having me on. In spite of the fact that I can't talk about uh, projects, <laughs> but Still, we but we did. We talked we about did. Hollywood radio players, and hopefully, we uh, gained some new audiences for that. And I really appreciate that. And uh, Michael sends his thanks as well. Absolutely. Thank and you. And, I will. And the Wi-Fi held. And the what? It's, it's that Masters me. McQueen connection. And that's it. That's you it. Yes. Spirit is all around. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, yeah. Very. I can't tell you how unusual that is. I, I really cannot tell you. Just. Uh, it was. It's been really it was bad for meant a day. To be. It was, it was meant, meant to be. be. But thank uh, well, you. I really, uh, you're very welcome. Hope you enjoyed the time with me as I much did. as I oh, absolutely you. have with you. And you're welcome back anytime, Lee. Love to come back. It's, I mean, it's a great pleasure to be on your show. And, uh, and I will come back. I promise. I you. appreciate that. And spread the word. You know, other folks you think would like to come on, they're all welcome to join of us. Course. And uh, I appreciate the kind words. And as my dad told me when I was like seven or eight with his wonderful Irish New York wit and wisdom, he said, <laughs> again, all this, like you talk about people coming to you when you were seven and eight for yes. guidance. My father's <laughs> wit and wisdom imparted uh, very early and says, still stuck with me today. Jim, whenever anybody says something kind or nice to you, ask them to mm -hmm. please put it in writing and address it management. <laughs> oh, how cool oh. is that? Huh? How how smart was that at an early age to instill really smart. very important <laughs> words <laughs> like that? And that stuck with you. Stuck with me, yeah. Yeah, it, it yeah. was. Yeah, those wonderful comments like that. Well, oh. uh, congratulations on all continued blessing Thank and joy you. and success Thank with all. And uh, again, you're welcome back anytime, my friend. It's always a joy to have you here. Oh, it's a joy to be here. And um, who and knows? you look marvelous, like oh, I said you, earlier. Thank you. Thank million you so bucks. Much. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I did my hair. Still effervescent and twinkling. <laughs> I love it. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go now. Thank you to yes. all the levities who yes. were here. Really you go, appreciate you go make a sandwich now. <laughs> sandwich. I'm going to make a sandwich. Yes. Uh, but thank you all to all the levities for being here and for your wonderful comments. And please do watch Hollywood Radio Players. And thank you, Jim. Absolutely. I'll be, I'll be back. She'll be back. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. You're the best. You take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye for now.